This is going to be a simple video about tuning our violin and I'll keep it as short and simple as I can. When you're first learning to tune the violin, it's helpful to use the little needle to verify, but only use it to verify what you think you're hearing with your ear. And that'll help you to calibrate or to build your confidence. So I like to use a tone generator and I'll put it on A. Traditionally, we start tuning the A string first. There's a lot of reasons for that. It takes a lot of practice to learn to equate the electronic sound of a tone generator with the acoustic organic sound of a violin. You have to ignore the timbre and just listen to the pitch, and that comes with practice. So you take your tone generator and put it on A, and then match with your ear the best you can. It's advantageous for beginners to have fine tuners on every string. They're cheap, they're easy to put on, and the pegs take a long time to master. They just do. So I would totally recommend putting fine tuners on every single string. They can come off later. And so you'll probably use your fine tuner to match exactly. Then turn off the tone generator and look at your little gauge and see if if you matched exactly. Now the bow can make the violin sound out of tune and the bow can also make the needle just bounce around so when you're learning to tune it's really important that you have the ability to draw a nice long steady bow. At least two big fat beats per bow. Okay, if, if you can't do that, then it's going to be harder for you to use the, the needle. Okay, then you do that with all four of your strings, and you're pretty much good to go after that point. But that's just for the beginning uh, level of tuning. As you get more advanced, you'll tune in fifths, and this is what you hear professional or advanced violinists doing. You'll hear them tune their A string first. They might move their peg. They might make little adjustments up here. That's because if you push right here in the peg box, it makes the string a little teensy weensy bit higher. That's a little bit risky because it, after you play on it a while, it'll return to being out of tune, but in a pinch, it can really help to settle your nerves or to feel like you got your string in tune. <laughs> Okay, if you're just a tiny bit sharp, sometimes you'll see violinists stretching in the middle of their string, and that lowers it just a little bit. But it's best if you can nail it exactly by using just your peg. Then you hear them go, they play their D string with their A string, and therefore their A string is set, so now they're tuning their D string to match the A string. For some reason, this old fiddle is extremely hard to get exactly in tune using the pegs. I should put fine tuners on it. But what we're listening for when we're tuning to a fifth, the fifth is called a perfect fifth, and we're listening for that perfect, clear interval with no warbles, with no dissonances happening. It's like the difference of looking through a slightly dirty window and looking through a window where you can't even tell there's a window there. That's kind of my analogy for a perfect fifth. And let me see if I can get the warbles to happen. Do you hear the flutter? You might not on the, through this audio. When it's a fast flutter, that means you're quite out of tune. The closer you get, the slower the flutter 
goes until it just disappears. So you go from this really jagged flutter to a little bit of a wave and eventually just a flat line of a perfect fifth. So let me get it back into tune. <laughs> Low. Uh, 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 uh. Listen. I hope you can hear that. There. It's really subtle, but you'll learn to be sensitive to that and to correct it. So that's what we're doing when we tune, and then we tune our G string to our D string. And again, that just takes practice, learning to hear the perfect fifth versus the fluttery fifth. Now there's technique in using our pegs. There's huge technique because for the pegs to stay in place, we have to push in as we turn. So first of all, your pegs need to be in good working order. And sometimes that means you have to apply peg compound to get them to grip without too much pushing in. The peg compound helps in both ways. It helps to lube it up a little bit if it's just stuck and creaky. It adds some lubricant to that, but it also adds grip. So it's really amazing stuff. It solves both problems of too loose or too tight. Then what we need to do is learn how to use the pegs on this side and how to use the pegs on this side. You see a lot of people taking their violin down to tune and then they have to pluck because it's easier to push in as we turn the peg in this position. You'll also see people bend down and press against their leg so that for these pegs so that they can push in as they turn. And sometimes I have to do that too. If my pegs aren't cooperating, we resort to whatever works. But ideally, you want to be able to be in normal playing position. And for this side of the, of the peg box, I like to put my ring finger and my pinky on this side of the scroll. And I can't do it when I'm thinking about it. And, <laughs> and I basically push against, I push this direction with my ring finger and my pinky while I'm pushing this direction with my tuning fingers. Okay, so let me see if I can forget thinking about it so I can do it naturally. Okay, so that's kind of a contortion. I, there wasn't room for my ring finger over there, so I just used my pinky. it exclusively with my pinky because there's not as much room for two fingers. So that takes some pinky strength, but you don't really need all that much. It's a feeling of security to have that pinky there resisting you as you're pushing in. Okay, now on this side, your pegs should really be, this is the ideal position. And this is horrible because of the position it forces your hand to go in into, watch, to tune, my hand has to be bent clear like this. Whereas this one allows me to be in a more natural position. So it's worth it. It's worth the trouble to undo this string, wind it in a different way, like give yourself a little bit longer tail and rewind it so that the peg stops in tune in this position. And it might take several tries. So, but it's worth it because then you're in a nice tuning position. And I've allowed this peg to stay this way because I don't ever use the E peg I, so rarely that I just left it that way. I would not be able to tune properly with the peg in this position. It's impossible because I know I have to, well, I'll show you. It won't stay. I don't have the strength to push in hard enough in that contortion. Ah. 
but for my E string, I always just use my fine tuner, and if I need to, I'd put my violin down to tune my E. Now on my professional violin, I don't let my pegs get into that horrible position <laughs> um, because I need them to be able to be cooperative under pressure a lot, so, so this wouldn't happen. But let me show you how I tune with my A string. I use these fingers to grip the peg and then I use my index finger to resist. And that works just fine. So on this side, my pinky resists. And on this side, my index finger is the one that resists. Okay, and once again, long bows as much as you can and steady bows and use your your tone generator and your little needle, tuning needle, to verify what you think your ear is hearing. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.